Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast of being the best version of yourself. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Heller. Today, we have a special guest, Catherine. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Well, good morning, um, Carrie. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'm a former nurse practitioner and now a health and wellness um, life coach. And uh, I specialize in emotional alchemy and helping people regain physical and mental energy. So I like working with people who are tired of feeling tired and worried and um, and help them uh, regain that sustained um, energy and focus, uh, both physically and mentally, so they can, you know, so they can um, have better um, outcomes in their life, better relationships, um, feel better in their mind and body, have more self-confidence, feel more at peace with themselves and, and, you know, happier in their relationships and their work and whatnot. So um, I'm currently pursuing a, um, studying a PhD, a doctorate in natural medicine. So this is opening up a whole new uh, world from my former medical background. This is with Quantum University. So we're bringing quantum physics and consciousness back into health, back into the holistic model of mind and body connection, because they don't go one without the other. And I know we're going to have a nice conversation about this. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> All right, well, great. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you. So, I mean, maybe a first question to think about is for people, like, what would you tell someone if, you know, they, they, they present with certain issues and they just feel like, oh, what, I'm never going to get better. Why should I even try? Yeah. And that's the um, um, not even trying because of, of the expectation of failure. And here's the thing, you're, all of your cells in your body, they respond to where you focus your attention. You, we, we know that energy flows where attention goes. And so if you're focused on, it's not going to work, I've tried everything, you're basically setting yourself setting yourself up for failure, right? And so what I like to do is use small hinges that open big door. And it starts with being open to the possibility that because you had a tunnel vision and was, was focused on what was not working, all of the opportunity for success were right there around you, but you didn't see them. So what if by just opening up your focus, and opening up your um, uh, where you're looking at things that, oh, all of a sudden, oh, opportunities for success are coming to you. And well, it sounds like it's kind of like the idea of kind of almost taking like a bird's eye view, taking a step out of kind of this narrow focus you have on yourself and looking more globally at stuff can help you to figure out what, what am I missing that's the myth that would allow me to sort of make things better in my life. Yes. And also, oftentimes when people want something in their life, whether it's more energy or they want to lose weight or they want to, you know, make more money, whatever it is, they get sort of trenched into what it has to look like. And so <laughs> if what what they're expecting that it's going to look like doesn't come, but it's out there, it looks completely different uh, and it, it will bring the same outcome, they completely miss it. And so it's release the attachment of what to what it has to be, what it has to look like, right? And opening up to a journey of discovery, releasing the expectations and the judgments. Right, but I guess on some level, like having a goal to strive for, so some, some sense of what it might look like, even like different possibilities. How do you feel like that plays into someone's motivation to make those changes in the first place? Absolutely. And I mean, in coaching, that's the, the number one step is to set up a goal. It's like you're setting up your GPS coordinates. So while in the past you were focused on what was not working, your GPS coordinate was <laughs> bringing you to what was not working. So, so what do you want instead? I like to use sort of the pivot method, like the 180 degree. Okay, you, you don't want this. We're clear. You no longer want this in your life. What do you want instead? And sometimes it's the exact opposite. And that's the GPS coordinate that we punch into your, um, you know, into your psyche so that you can focus your attention on going there while remaining open to how it may show up in your life. But totally, I mean, without a goal, without a destination, we go in circles, yeah. right? <laughs> All right. So this idea of striving for a goal, 
but also sort of being open to possibilities along the way. So see, it's similarly the idea of it's about sort of a different journey to maybe somewhat of, a, of the same end goal, but you know, there may be variability in that end goal. Like maybe the general idea is there, but that what specifics of it may sort of become more clear as you get closer to what that actually looks like. Absolutely. Yes. And clarity comes from action. Sometimes it's, oftentimes it's taking action, action before you even feel ready and to trust in your ability to figure things out. And it's like, as you put one foot in front of the other towards that goal, it's, it's like when you punch the GPS coordinate to go somewhere, you might hit some construction, detours, traffic jams, but you're still, you're still heading for that goal, but you're on the journey of the adventure of where life is taking you and releasing the, um, the judgment of, oh, I'm going to be late, or oh, this construction. It's like, no, be open to what this is bringing to you and, and uh, reaping the gifts of all of these things because it makes the journey much more fun. It's not about the destination, right? It's about the journey. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, for someone that has a lot of chronic health issues, how do you navigate helping them to, you know, on some level, you know, be in, you know, in, in tune with you know, the mind body connection, but also be able to kind of, you know, maybe use some, some, some tools to say, you know, even though I don't feel great, here's how I can sort of co compensate and maybe get done what I need to get done, not push myself, but still be able to function at least adequately as opposed to sort of not doing anything at all. Absolutely. It's about baby steps, you know, um, with someone who's had a chronic illness, I like to look at the whole, like the global picture. It's not just their physical body. It's a lot about the mental and the emotional body because the physical body, we now know from, you know, the sciences of psychoneuromyology and epigenetics that the physical body responds to what's in the mind, in the mental, in the emotional. So let's say someone could eat the most organic foods and try to help themselves in that way. But if their thoughts are toxic and if they're constantly judging themselves for not being able to do stuff, they're, um, uh, you know, or they're being wounded emotionally and, and can't let go of grudges of the past, it's like eating fast food. It's as toxic to the body as eating fast food, right? So we look at, of course, we look at the food, we look at the physical thing, you know, sleep, how's their sleep, how's their um, movement more than exercise. Um, but very soon, I like to dive into the, the mental aspects and the emotional aspects. And I found, I mean, I myself, I'm a survivor and remissioner of a chronic Lyme disease that was dormant in my body for 16 years. And I recovered in, in ways that were unheard of. I mean, I, in, on forums and yes, I did a lot of stuff on my physical body, but I did such a deep journey of emotional healing and with somebody uh, with a chronic illness, when something is persisting in one's life, there is usually what's called a secondary benefit. And there, I'm saying this with no judgment, but what I'm seeing in, in the people that I've helped with Lyme disease recover their health and their life is it's like their bodies were thinking, you know, if you put yourself in the mind of the body <laughs> that, well, if I heal and I give my human all the energy back and they, the human just throws me back into overworking, people pleasing, putting other people's needs first. They're just throwing me back into the conditions that got me sick in the first place. I ain't doing that. I'm holding on to this disease. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, so it's the idea that even though it's, those things are not causing the disease, it makes it easier to hold on to sort of the benefits you get out of it. And in turn, you know, and this can obviously be said for other things. I mean, I see this, you know, kids where, you know, if they have a hard time getting stuff done, like the HD or, or, you know, just general psychic function issues, sometimes the, the secondary benefit is it allows them to kind of keep having someone help them as opposed to learn to do it themselves. Yes. And so once we uncover the secondary benefits with compassion, no judgment, then it's easier to see that, oh, okay. I've been holding on to this disease subconsciously because of these benefits. So this disease was one pathway to get to these benefits, right? So oftentimes, you know, taking the, the example of kids, <clears throat> what they want is love and connection. Well, constantly requesting help is one pathway, but what if there were other pathways? And so what we do in coaching is we open up choice. And we open up multiple different pathways to get to the same outcome, because oftentimes these are deep human needs that are relevant. You know, it's a need for love, for safety, 
for belonging, right? And so oftentimes with what I've noticed with people with Lyme is once they learn how to set healthy boundaries, how to prioritize their own well-being, knowing that when they put their max, their oxygen mask on themselves first, they can help another person, like just in, like in the airplane. Once they learn how to set healthy boundaries, how to prioritize themselves without feeling guilty or selfish, once they make some changes in their lives, such as you know, sometimes changing jobs or changing relate relationships that no longer aligns, then it's like the disease becomes obsolete and it naturally evolves out of the body. The body wants to come back to balance. It wants to come back to homeostasis, which is a state of equilibrium. And it has all the resources necessary for that. All we gotta do is give it the, the right conditions so that it can return to balance and harmony. Right, but it sounds like you're talking about the, the mental piece. Obviously the physical piece, I'm assuming is partially because it, obviously if there's a medical cause you need to address medically, you probably have to address that as well. Of course, you work on all levels, but in the medical field, and you know, I was a nurse practitioner before, so I, I know the the scope of the medical field, and um, I think we we've been trained as a society to think that medicine is all there is, but it's not, right? So, what if by encompassing a much broader scope and working with holistic practitioners, it's um, it's much easier to sort of set set pillars back as the foundation for the body to uh, recover, recover from, you know, in the medicine, we have paradigms that say, oh, you can't heal from chronic illnesses. Once you've got hypertension, you've got it for life. No. Once you got diabetes, you got it for life. No. There are numerous examples of people who have reversed these illnesses by making some mind-body changes in their lives that sometimes are less radical than what people think. Um, but I'm definitely not suggesting that people quit their medical follow-up. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Keep your medical follow-up, but including something that's um, addressing more of the mental, the emotional aspects, even spiritual aspects. And it does influence the body greatly. Right. And based on what you're saying, I would assume would meditation be kind of a, a big part of this? Yeah, definitely. Mindfulness practices. My, meditation is not for everybody. And we have this thought that, oh, we have to sit for half an hour with our eyes closed and things like that. But there are so many different types of meditation. Um, you know, in general, it's being more mindful, more mindful of the present moment, spending less time in the past and in the future in our mind, um, meditating, clearing our mind. Um, it can be chanting. Uh, to just put ourselves into a happier state um, can be a walking meditation where you're walking and you're just very, very present and observing, you know, the flowers, the trees and, and recovering the sense of awe and wonder that when we're living a fast paced life, we're just not very present. It's like our, our bodies are like running and our, our soul or our, our energy is like outside of the body trying to catch up being like, Hey, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in terms of mindfulness activities, what would you suggest to someone that has a hard time focusing and, you know, the thought of listening to something even for, you know, 10 minutes is, is kind of off-putting, like as a way yes. to sort of start with meditation or mindfulness activities? You know, um, start with baby steps. So somebody who's got trouble focusing, start with one minute, just close your eyes, do some deep breaths, sometimes just 10 deep breaths where you inhale five seconds, you hold for five seconds and you excel for seven seconds. This is gonna switch from the sympathetic um, side of the nervous system, which is the stress response of like, er, fight and flight. It's gonna switch you back into the parasympathetic, which is the relaxation response, the heal and, and digest and, and opens up um, focus and creativity. So definitely, you know, start with one minute of that. Get yourself slowly, go up to two minutes, three minutes. You know, sometimes we we think, oh, I have to do like 30 minutes all at once. No, no, no. Just start with small. It's better to do one minute than not do it at all. Right. And so definitely in the mind, um, just calming the mind, calming the thoughts, 
um, or just being a neutral observer of the thoughts. It's like, how interesting I'm having this thought and I'm just letting it go. It's just like thoughts are, are moving through you without activating your nervous system. Um, focus is such a, um, I mean, just like anything else, but focus is such a broad topic because so many things can influence focus. You know, for example, if somebody is not eating right for their body, if they're not balancing their blood sugars, you know, if somebody, I don't know, if they're eating like sugary cereal in the morning and, and all they have is sugar, I mean, an hour later, they're going to have a sugar crash. And, and when there's a sugar crash, this is a state of emergency for the brain. The brain's not going to be able to focus on, you know, lectures and schoolwork. It's going to be like, oh, I'm feeling anxious. And, you know, so um, adjusting nutrition for focus is actually really important. I can't tell you, Carrie, the impact it had on me to when I became a health coach, you know, to learn about how to stabilize my blood sugar. I mean, I was already a nurse, nurse practitioner for, you know, 10, 10 years, you know, 15 years. And I was like, wow, it's so simple. We should teach that to kids in school because it really opened up you know, having, instead of having, you know, sugar peaks and sugar crashes and having to snack every two hours and feeling shaky and irritable and all that, I was really, it's like, I was really stable. It's like I put some big logs into the wood stove instead of some kindling wood that I have to throw every 20 minutes. Right. And, um, and the focus is amazing. So definitely food, definitely small increments of, of meditative practice, mindfulness, and moving the body, the body needs to, you know, move and, and eliminate excess um, agitation, if you will. Um, and obviously, we live in a world of high distractions. So if we're going to improve our focus. We don't have to have a diagnosis of ADHD to have some, <laughs> to, to fall into some distractions. And so being intentional in cutting off distraction, if there's going to be something I need to work on for the next 20 minutes, well, putting the phone away and the, the notifications in mute. And so I can re really, really focus and, and do some deep work. Um, yeah, that's definitely good advice. Cause it's, I mean, certainly there can be a lot of reasons why people have a hard time focusing. ADHD certainly can be one of them, but anxiety, depression, just in yes. general, too much going on. I mean, there's lots of things that people can have trouble with in terms of attention that really has nothing to do with ADHD. Um, I think oh, sleep right. is another big thing to kind of add. I think the nutrition makes a lot of sense you mentioned, but I think sleep also, I mean, I see that quite a bit that, you know, as teens or adults, there's not getting enough sleep. I mean, often it can look like ADHD or, or various other issues of attention, the sheer, sheer fact if you're not getting enough sleep. Exactly, exactly. And there are studies in, in uh, productivity studies that show that when you're deficient in one hour of sleep, the next day you lose 30 points on your IQ. So, so not sleeping makes us dumber, <laughs> right? Or just not, not able to have access to the higher faculties that that we already have so I agree with you you know when I was a nurse practitioner I was astounded at how easily the diagnosis of ADHD was given to someone without having a global evaluation um, of, of all of these aspects like you say someone who's sleep deprived and and gotten used to to function on less hours of sleep they think that's their reality it's very hard to focus when when your brain is just tired it hasn't had a chance to clean it cleanse itself at night when we sleep the gliolymphatic system in the brain uh cleanse the brain like the the toxins of the day and things like that so if we don't get that restful sleep especially also if we go to bed with a full stomach which is not recommended by the way um the body is busy digesting the food rather than cleansing the brain and and fixing the learnings of the day and to the memories and and different things like that so um sometimes people might feel like they get enough sleep but if if they don't have good sleep habits before they go to sleep it impairs the the quality of the sleep even though they stayed let's say i don't know seven eight hours in bed it's still not rejuvenating so it's important to look at the global picture um, in the mind body fashion. <laughs> right. No, I think it's definitely a really crucial point that it's not just about the number of hours of sleep, but also the quality. 
And that by doing stuff before you go to bed, it can help increase sort of the quality of sleep and in turn get all the benefits you get out of the time you put into it. Totally, totally. One of the big things for sleep is definitely blue light. So I'm, I'm wearing my blue light uh, blockers anytime I'm in front of a computer. And this is the daytime, but it's even more important at night. And to shut down screens for at least two hours before you go to sleep so your brain can secrete your uh, natural melatonin, which is, you know, the the neurotransmitter, the hormone that helps you go to sleep. So yeah, that's definitely important. I do that on my computer. I turn off the blue light on my computer and have it go into night mode and do it on my phone. And some yeah. of that stuff I just leave on night mode all the time because I don't even notice the difference that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depending on what device it is and what I'm using yeah. it for. But yeah, I mean, I think it's the idea too, is all these little things you put together that can make a big difference. It's often not just one magic bullet, but it's all these little things you put together in different ways to increase your health and in turn improve your focus and you know your overall you know positive experience with life paired with also your mindset of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything, every little thing counts. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming to do it all at once. You know, people will read, I don't know, like an ebook and it says meditate, eat better, sleep, exercise. And then they're trying to do it all at once. And then that's when it, it might work for a day or two. And then it's too much because it's, it's different from their norm of what they've been living. And so that's when people get discouraged and they say, it doesn't work. I can't do it. And then they stop. Right. Right. It's the and idea so, that the more you try to do, sometimes the less you actually get or end up doing. Whereas if you start yes. small with one or two things and gradually leave those in and then add new things after that, you're probably going to have more success with long-term changes. Absolutely. You need a system, step-by-step -step system that, that will introduce, you know, the different things at the different timing uh, in such a way that it makes it sustainable. It makes it like, oh, okay, I can do this. Oh yeah. Okay. And now this is, intro it, you know, included in my routine. Okay. Now I'm ready for the next thing. And it, it, it can be just very small things, but like I said, small hinges open big door. It's amazing. What I remember being a nurse practitioner when I became a coach and I was still working as a nurse practitioner. Um, I would help my patient just to adapt their breakfast, just, just, just breakfast so that they would have enough proteins and, and um, good balances of fats and, and carbs to sustain their energy. And I can't tell you um, the impact it made uh, especially on some of my patients that were on anxiety meds and even depression meds and just that little change. And of course, you know, being more mindful and grateful for the things in their life. Some of them ask me to stop their medications and we were able to, to, you know, wean the medication successfully. It was awesome. And I'm like, wow, imagine how many people could be free of their medication. Cause I mean, how many, what's, I don't know what's the recent stats on how many people are on antidepressants or anxiety meds, but I know it's pretty high. Yeah. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but yeah, but I think it also goes to the fact that, you know, for some people, the reasons for having those issues are more situational and, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you can address those based on addressing situations themselves or coping tools for others. You know, there's more of a biological component that meals you know, a little bit harder. Like even if things seem to be going fine, it, it's harder, you know, those issues still occur, even if you don't have a, set, a tangible trigger. Totally. You know, yeah. Obviously, everyone's different in terms of, you know, when medicine makes sense or doesn't. But either way, you know, these, you know, sort of, you know, behavioral tools you can use are, are often quite helpful, whether it's enough to get off medicine or not. Or, but either Absolutely. way, it helps because, you know, I mean, with ADHD, medicine often helps a lot or can help a lot for the right person, but it's usually not going to fix things 100%. And so that's where the behavioral strategies come into play to kind of, you know, fill in the gaps. And then, you know, for some people, they can do fine without medicine with enough behavioral tools. For others, they still need the medicine, but having the behavioral tools still helps them to get sort of better coverage in terms of symptom reduction. Absolutely. And they can go from surviving to thriving. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, this was good. Do you, I guess, do you, have, do you have any any final sort of thought, th thoughts for our listeners and anything you'd like to share related to our conversation for today? Um, You know, it's like anything in life. We... As human beings, we're very resilient and we adapt to situations pretty quickly. And we also adapt to a suboptimal norm of energy, of focus, of joy in our life. So um, I want to invite people to not settle for um, something that feels like, oh, it's the norm because everybody's doing it, right? I think that the model that we live in in society, the fast pace, the distraction, 
is not a healthy model to follow. So I want to inspire people to look at their life and see what is it that they're tolerating? What is it that they're not, um, you know, that they're complaining about or that they're um, in their minds, they're thinking, oh, I, I can never get improvement on that. And just open yourself up to the possibility that it can get better and that baby steps can get you there. You don't have to jump, you know, to climb a mountain, um, but choose one, focus on one aspect of your life that you would like to improve today and take some baby steps. And you'll see that it is going to impact other aspects of your life because how we do one thing is how we do everything. And it can get better. In fact, the better it gets, the better it gets. All right. Well, that's great advice. Well, thank you. And I guess if you want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Yes. So um, they can, people can find me on Facebook and Instagram, Catherine Gagnon, Transformational Coach. I think my Instagram is Catherine Transformational Coach. And uh, my website is my name, CatherineGagnon.ca. So I'll just spell it because it's the French way. So it's www.catherine.ca. And so there's information on my website about different programs and how to reach me by email. So. All right, well, wonderful. Thanks, thanks again for coming out. There. It was a great conversation. We definitely appreciate you joining us today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. You're welcome.